Is your digital content or your virtual webinars, meetings, and events putting your audience to sleep? Our guest, Brian Fanzo, is going to catapult us into the digital future with his outstanding strategies, solutions, insights, and inspiration. Hello and welcome everyone to the Startup Life Show. I'm your host, Andy Lyons, startup founder, coach, podcast host, and co-host of a popular monthly startup pitch event right here in beautiful Boston, USA called Founders Live Boston. And we are live right now on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, all thanks to the sensational platform, StreamYard. Founders and all of you who are tuning in live, I am so grateful you carved out time to tune in and up your founder game. Those of you tuning in live, please introduce yourselves in the comment thread. Let folks know where you're hailing from and share your business name and website with each other. Use this opportunity to expand your network, connect with each other on LinkedIn, and follow each other on social media. You never know where the next collaboration will come from. Your questions and comments are important. Please pop them into the comment threads during our conversation, and we'll do our best to answer them live. Because the theme of Startup Life is a problem shared is a problem halved. Perhaps someone you know would benefit from tonight's conversation, then please share this URL on your feed so other folks can join in on all the fun. Thank you. So tonight, we have joining us Girl Dad, digital futurist, international keynote speaker, and virtual, I'm calling him valuetainer and edutainer, someone I have watched soar since 2016. Let's give a round of applause and a hearty welcome to the one and only Mr. Brian Fanzo. Woo! <laughs> Thank you for having me. You know, sometimes I talk here. here and I go, are we really live? You know, these live, the live streams are always so fascinating. <laughs> it was great. Um, Brian, I want everybody to know, here you were, it was about an hour ago, and you were giving a presentation. And what happened? But share with everybody yeah mid mid presentation it was actually my third presentation of the day um and i was giving the presentation and i'm here in northern virginia and mid sentence the power flicked out and it it, it dropped and uh, it's not raining outside but it's been really windy today and it came back on for a second came back off and then there was police sirens all over the place so uh oh unfortunately i lost power here at my house uh, so I was like, okay, how do I adapt to that? And thankfully I was able to record um, from my phone uh, the end of the video that I was doing for the presentation, uploaded that quickly to there. And then I was like, okay, it's about seven o'clock here uh, in Virginia. And I was like, well, how do I get lighting and get it set up? So I, I have a backup battery and a, a ring light that plugs into a power charger. And I have my iPhone on a, on a tripod and, and we're rolling with the punches. To my founders, do we all relate? I mean, how many times have we been left in the lurch and had to go, oh my gosh, I gotta figure this out like two seconds ago. Brian, you are the best of models showing us tonight how don't let the show stop. It has to go on and here's how you do it. And it's always a little squirrely with live stream. I mean, this is my eighth episode and I'm still always going, eh, how's this working? Everything happening okay? And there are a lot of things I've, you know, we mess up, I mess up a little, but you know, each week I get a little better and we'll figure it all out just like you did. I'm so impressed with that quick, fast shift. And now you're using your phone. You've got a battery. Show everybody, you got a battery to your ring light. Come on, that's called being prepared. I lost Were you? Your audio. Oh, you lost my audio. Okay, great. Well, there we go. We're going to go with the flow, everybody. <laughs> we'll work it out. In the meantime, what I love about what Brian just nailed down was using everything at his disposal so that he could show up. And that's what you have to do for you and for your business when all evidence that everything around you is kind of going in a mess. And it's typical of our founder life. And it's how we have to roll with the punches, with the good times, et cetera. So I'm going to just say hi, hi, hi. Yeah. Hey. Hey, Vicky. 
<laughs> it's so I good to see your you. audio for some reason now. I'm not sure. Hmm. Oh. Hey, Vicky, would you let me know if you can hear me? Because maybe it's something on my end. Hmm. And, and then Brad, Brian, we have this amazing video marketing, incredible edutainer here in Boston called Brad Powell. And he adds value and he's got a great Facebook group. He's wonderful. And so happy to have him. Okay, you can hear us both. Excellent. So happy you could join us tonight, Brad. And mm -hmm. hi, Natalia. So good to see you. Thanks for being here, everybody. This oh, is my new marketing know. coordinator. And she's amazing. I'm so happy to have her. She's an intern, but she's a marketing coordinator and she's helping the startup life. And I'm thrilled to have her on board. Thank you, Natalia. Okay, so I bet Brian's gonna come back in because like anything in life, it's, it's not working, unplug it and plug it back in. Or, <laughs> or you know, leave and come back in. I no? have no idea what we're going, uh, I can hear you. Can you oh, hear good, me? yeah. I was just saying to everybody, this is life. You know, sometimes we wish we could do that for our bodies, right? Unplug ourselves and plug ourselves back in, right? Yeah, I always say the only guarantee with live video is that something will go wrong. So we got the we got the guarantee out of the way. So that's uh, excellent. <laughs> you know, and and having been a Google Hangouts host, trust me, folks. Oh yes, the StreamYard platform is so much more stable. You yeah. never knew what was going to happen on the Google Hangout day. That's true. So before we dive into digital marketing and virtual valuetainment, I want you to share with folks your startup story because Brian, I watched you. I mean, we I checked on Facebook. We've been friends since November, 2016. Very so nice. somewhere around there, you were starting to drum up your digital marketing background. And I watched you evolve into this international speaker, keynote speaker. Share with folks how it was that you left payroll because that's always the big challenge and how you started off on your own business run. Sure. So, you know, for me, I, I, I feel like I have an interesting path in the sense of um, I worked for an enterprise uh, government contractor for nine years uh, here in Northern Virginia, one of the largest government contractors uh, for nine years. And I loved my job. Absolutely loved the enterprise, um, was moving up uh, pretty much faster than anyone uh, my age. They had to change different rules in the, the guidelines for different positions that I was getting promoted um, into here, you know, working for the government. And uh, I had actually got promoted and, and our contract was coming to an end and I decided I'm either going to stay in cybersecurity for the government for the rest of my life or I'm going to jump ship now. And uh, against all of my mentors' directions, um, I jumped ship to a data center startup that was moving into cloud computing um, based out of Phoenix. And it was really, they gave me an opportunity to have my dream job, which was a, a technology evangelist uh, modeled after Guy Kawasaki and what he was doing there at Apple um, back in those days. And I was at the startup for two years and 10 days. Um, and, you know, the funny thing is about six months into my my job there, you know, in 2014, uh, I was awarded, a, the there was a, a award came out from The Economist called the Top 25 Social Business Leaders of the Future. And I remember my CEO was like, I'm not even sure what this is. And he threw it on my desk. Um, and what was neat was it, it allowed me to travel to all of these different um, IBM events. I got to go to TED Talks. I got to sit with some of like my heroes in the marketing, social media, uh, future of work space. And it, during that six months, that first six months of the startup, everyone was telling me, Brian, you should go work for yourself. Brian, you should go on your own. Um, and of course, I wasn't ready, um, or I didn't think I was ready. Um, and even my CEO at my one year mark, uh, the startup I was at, he was like, are you sure you want to stick around again? I'm like, yes, I want to stick around. You know, I, I'm not ready. Uh, and so interestingly enough, we were actually getting acquired uh, by CenturyLink. And the CEO pretty much came in and said, you know, I know you have, you know, uh, kids. You have your third kid is on the way and, and you know, your life is a little crazy. Uh, you know, and I, and I like to say, I, I got a really golden parachute um, into entrepreneurship as nice. he pretty much came up and said, you know, what? what's your income, you know, this is the CEO who I reported to, he's like, what's your take home right now at our at our, at our work? And I told him and he's like, I'll give you that for six months to consult on my startups that I'm working with on the side, uh, but today has to be your last day. And, uh, you know, it was an interesting time because 
at that point, like I had become the face of that brand speaking yeah. around the world. Even when you walked in the front uh, entry level, there was a giant like poster the size of a garage door. So like my face, like welcoming you. And so for me, it was like the last thing I thought of. But, you know, looking back, it was the push and the kick I, you know, I definitely needed. And what for year me, was, it's interesting. What year was I, that, Brian? Um, that was, so it was uh, between Christmas and New Year's 2014. So the start of 2015 is when uh, I kind of got kicked into uh, this arena. Anyway, and I loved my enterprise life and I loved working for my startup. And so it's funny how like, you know, it kind of was one of those worlds where now, you know, kind of carving out my own uh, path year. And you know, that first year, 2015, I did some marketing agency work. I did some consulting, I did a couple of different things. Um, and I still really couldn't figure out what was going on. So probably when we were connected is as I was starting to get a grasp on, you know, what I wanted to do and, you know, and how I could turn this into a business. It takes time for all of us. You know, it's not this overnight mythology that people love to say and share. What was the moment, though, when you knew that you were going to nail some great speaker opportunities? Because that's a great revenue stream. So it's funny because um, for me, I've actually been speaking since 2005. Um, the, my government lead came down and said, hey, Brian, uh, you're, the, you're, you're one of the only non-gray-haired guys that we have in cybersecurity. Um, he's like, and you you don't shut up. So like, I'm guessing you'll be okay getting in front of people. Uh, and they sent me to a training course. I had to pass a five day course um, to be able to present at the Pentagon here in DC. Uh, and so I got to do that. I got to present uh, every quarter uh, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff here in Washington, DC. Um, and then at the startup, I was speaking on behalf of the brand all over. Actually, sure. the largest events I've ever spoke at were actually when I worked at the startup. Uh, but I still, throughout that entire period, didn't really know speaking was a profession. Like it was to me part of my job and, and an element. And I was like, well, there's celebrities and people with lots of books. And then there's people like myself who were, you know, sponsors or working for a brand. And so when I went on my own, speaking was an actually interesting enough. Like I didn't even think of it as a revenue stream. I was looking at it as a brand building um, element. And so um, as I started to kind of uh, try to make my feet, get my feet wet in the uh, social media uh, landscape. They, they wouldn't give me a, a side stage to a side stage of a side stage. And I was like, you know, I presented at VMworld in front of 19,000 people. And I was the I was the opening keynote and Wozniak was the closing keynote. And they're like, yeah, but we've never heard of you. You don't have a book. You don't have. And so for me, it was a very, it was fun because I got to speak on behalf of my government client, speak on the behalf of a sponsor brand, and then really start over from scratch. Um, and, and scratch from the business perspective, you know, it helped having years of getting on stage. Uh, and so, yeah, 2016, it was about 20% of my revenue. Uh, 2017, about, you know, 80%. And, you know, uh, 2019, it was about 95%, which sounds amazing until COVID hit. But, um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a wild ride. I've been to 76 countries total. Uh, you know, and my goal is to hit 100 uh, before I, my, my original goal was 100 by 40, which I have uh, two years left to do that. But uh, it might be 100 by 45. We'll see. But uh, yeah. Uh, and you can count. Wild. And now you can count good virtual events, too, because that's that, true. that does it all. Let's just say hi to a few people before we get into some of these questions I have. And remember, folks, your questions are important, too. But let's just say hello to Barbara. Hey, Barbara, you incredible published author doing fun things with your books. And of course, the founder of Founders Live, the one and only Mr. New Nick Hughes. Nick has a platform, Brian, that is in 60 countries. Startup. This is part of a startup pitch event that I do every month as part of the Founders Live platform. He's amazing. Very nice. Nikki, all the way from the UK, staying up late to be with us tonight. Thanks, doll. And of course, responsible for this lovely little overlay I have going down here. And here's a, a big moment. Hey, Kim, you're coming in for the first time. We're having LinkedIn comments. Now, Brian, your high AQ, high adaptability quotient, you'll love Kimberly's story. Kimberly's business provides everything you need to have the most incredible, oh my gosh, I don't know how to say it, but when you're from the um, Latina world, you have the big celebration when a girl turns 16. The kids young, the kids Thank young, you. Yeah, yes. So this is where her business was jamming and doing great things. Well, hello, screeching halt happened. They produced the most amazing masks and ah. sold them 
and they're phenomenal. You can dance in these things. They're so good. And yet they're protective and they can be washed. And that's how she kept her business alive. I mean, come on. These are the great stories that we need to hear everybody all the time. <laughs> and then, hi, Vicki. Yeah, I know. Isn't it exciting? Finally, LinkedIn comments. And Calvin, Calvin is a phenomenal, you know, he's had his startup days and he's had in payroll days and startup days, but he's an incredible, incredible mentor to founders in the greater Boston area. And one of my favorite people, Oye, how are you? Flavor Noir, tremendous entrepreneur, father of three two or three, I can't remember right now, but amazing human being as well. And of course, April, who always throws in great information and support every week. Thank you so much. So before we get into some questions, let's just talk about digital marketing in today's market. I mean, one of the things that I heard you say on Dan Ram's show that I thought was so powerful was about creating the right background, the right, the right vibe, et cetera, et cetera, for when you go live for when you communicate. And that's not just for how we are right here virtually. It's also the right vibe and how you connect with your customers. So how do you begin that journey today as we move forward? Because I don't know about you, but I've noticed that it's gotten noisier out there in the digital world. And we still, there's there's attention, there's a, you know emotional blackmail type attention, and there's real valuable attention. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so I think you know one of the things you know, and, I, and it's it's very interesting, you know, and you know the virtual world's a, an interesting space. Of course, I'm doing this almost via candlelight, which is you know very fun in, in that side of the of the world for me, uh, as someone that has an entire studio for cameras set up, and like you know this is you know web camera and a uh, ring light plugged into a battery a, a battery. But I think one of the things that is extremely important is setting your environment up for you to succeed, right? I think. In the world we're in right now, um, even you know, thanks to COVID, you know, just because we're more attached to our devices and we're more online doesn't mean we have more time, right? We still have 24 hours in the day. And you know, I've always argued, you know, when I worked at the government, um, I had uh, at one point 32 employees, and we were all remote. And when we were moving remote uh, for my entire team, one of the things I fought hard for was for us to increase our offline. Um, meetups for us to go to, to more events offline. And I remember my boss is like, did you just fight for working from home? Like, what do you mean you want to meet more? And I was like, well, we want the freedom to be able to be creative and productive when it makes sense for us, but it doesn't mean we want less time connecting in person, right? And so, and, and to me, I think that's an interesting spot we're in now because, you know, for me, I've worked from home for about 14 of my 17 years, you know, uh, post-college. And so I've worked, working from home has just kind of been my world, but I've also traveled 45 weeks a year on average. So for me, this is the longest I've been home ever. Since I, since I left you know, uh, college, I've never been home uh, two consecutive months. Uh, March 10th uh, was the last event I spoke at. I flew home on the afternoon of March 10th, and that's, you know, now we're <laughs> fast forward into the end of, uh, end of May. But, you know, when we're thinking about not only virtual, but in this world, like, I don't believe it's about online versus offline. It's about wh where does it work best for us, right? And so if it's something from brand building online to selling via phone call or in person or maybe vice versa. And I think right now we're all seeing that you know, video is a great connector. Like I can't even imagine this COVID environment without social media or video or law. I mean, I mean, I've had, we've done five family birthdays via Zoom, you know, like, you know, and my dad's quote after that birthday, um, they're in Arizona, um, he was like, this is one of my favorite birthday evenings I've ever had, right? And it was like, you know, and my dad is the, you know, he has LinkedIn, but that's about all he has from social. <laughs> and so, you know, I think when we look at now, one of the things I think a big mistake we make, and this is extremely important in this moment, is that we oftentimes try to take what we do offline and repurpose it online. We try to take what we do offline and repurpose it online. And I believe that will fail because there is nothing that will replace the offline connections, the serendipity that exists, the, the handshakes, the hugs, the that truly bonding connectivity. But I do believe if you use video, live video, social media, and invest the time in it, it will grow that offline connections. And I believe in this moment, we, can, we should look at what we do great offline and try to reinvent how we do that online. And that's the big difference for me. It's 
when we repurpose it, it's just, you know, talking, you know, you know, monotone talking head, you know, things that we were that worked there. But in the virtual world, we have new, you know, new possibilities, but also new limitations, right? And you know, when, when I talk to people, especially that are making that move, one of the things I always say is like, let me just hang out with you for two days and I'll tell you what you're doing wrong online. And they're like, what do you mean? I was like, because I can guarantee that the stories you tell at the happy hour, the conversations you have at your business meetings or open houses are never what you share online, right? It was like, and it's like, oh, well, I have my website, I have my message, I have my about page, but all of the things that work offline, we've, for, you know, we kind of distance ourselves. And so I tried for people to identify what those are and then reshape how we deliver them in this virtual world. And, you know, for a lot of people, this is shell shock. I've been, pre I mean, five years for me, I actually went back and found it. Five years ago, um, I made the, the statement, uh, it was actually a Google Hangout show. Uh, and I, I, I said, you know, social media will never replace a handshake. But if you invest in it, it'll give you the opportunity to have more handshakes and turn handshakes into hugs and selfies, because that's kind of... Kind of my, I, my I love that. And I think if anybody has been watching either The Voice, which I thought they pivoted yes. amazingly Amazing. well. And I think the SNL at home have been more creative um, than I've seen them be in years. It's way better now than it was. <laughs> like, I don't want them to go back. Like, they are much more creative at the moment. And I think you were talking about the NFL draft was amazing. I, and I, I mean, the NFL draft, I sat down. And I wrote on my paper, because I take notes, everything I watch just from a marketing consumption perspective. And I wrote down five things they did wrong. Like I completely expected the NFL to drop the ball, pun intended, um, yeah. with the, because there's such a big uh, behemoth. They didn't decide until uh, April 6th to do the NFL draft uh, online. Um, it's one of the biggest events. I, I've taken off work for that for many years. It's a big, you know, it's a big thing that I've always enjoyed. And they blew it out of the water. They did a, an amazing job, so much so that at the end of the virtual NFL draft, um, they were interviewing the commissioner. And he said, we've discussed eight to 10 things that we've never done before that we did virtually that we are now going to implement in next year's offline draft. And I was like, I mean, it completely blew me away. I mean, I spent, I mean, I spent close to 11 hours that weekend building out, you know, documenting and building out content. I did 250 screenshots of the, the virtual NFL draft because they did, you know, they, they kept some of the things that we love and associate with the offline experience, but they reinvented and reapproached different things. And you know, they allowed the, the children of the family of the different owners to come in the room. And, and it was because they had told them, we're going to do a wide shot, but we're not going to include audio because we want to give you the freedom. Well, by giving them that freedom, their family came in and all of a sudden every owner, every general manager's family started coming in. And so I think that's what, like, to me, that's the most beautiful example of if you're able, to, if you approach virtual to reinvent and try something new, you have no idea what possibly could happen, right? It could, it could create a brand new rev revenue stream. It could create a new, you know, a path for brand awareness. It could even just simply create a couple of new partnerships or relationships, you know, in ways that you've never imagined. And so like, I think it's, it's a, if for me, I've been telling and preaching for everybody to do this for five years. Uh, I don't always like people being forced to change because we know how that works when you're forced yes. to change. But there, we really have no choice. And I, you know, I'm excited for where we go from here moving forward. I, I tell you, it gives me goosebumps. And just hearing you recapture it all, you know, possibilities are very exciting because we as founders are never into it for the guarantee. No, it's for the delicious rush of the possibility. And now we're seeing creativity unleashed, imaginations unleashed because constraints have caused that. And that's like every phenomenal entrepreneurial moment and, and so delicious. I'm going to say hi to a few folks here. Yeah. I think this is great. Hey, Joy, I love that you were just hanging out on Twitter and this popped up. I love that. And um, and my co-host, AJ, how you doing, AJ? Pitch event. He's got an amazing business, Synergy Consulting. Love that man. And I know that um, we have a question up here from Brad Powell. I'm coming, Brad. I saw you in the stream. Here we go. Question for Brian, how are you pivoting from in-person speaking this spring and summer? So I can tell you March 10th, um, I, you know, I lost uh, 18 speaking gigs that were either pushed off to the next year. 
Um, the posits were, you know, we've been figuring that out. And unfortunately, all six of my full-time re retainer clients um, in that week decided to pause or end uh, contracts, some of them being a couple of years old. And I went through the typical grieving period that we all, I think we're going through of like, um, and, and as a speaker, I feel like we got a little bit early because we weren't really in lockdown at that time and people were still traveling. Um, and, you know, I was upset, I was frustrated. And interestingly enough, there was a whole lot of people that were coming to me and like, Brian, here's your time. Like you've been doing live video and virtual for so long. But for me, there was, there was this uh, idea of, I use social media and video and live streaming to grow my offline business. And so leveraging it to grow what a product that I'm selling that's almost similar, to me had this very like cannibalization factor. Um, I also have been working really hard um, at my keynote speaking fee with my agent and my team and you know doing about 60, 70 events a year, raising that bar. And when I looked at webinars or what I would consider, you know, those um, examples, I was very, uh, I, I was very like concerned. I was like, you know what, if I'm going to do this, which I knew I was going to do it, um, I'm going to do it with, with a, you know, a strategy of not only testing everything out, but pushing boundaries with the goal of fee integrity was one of my, one of my main goals was I wanted to be able to create a product virtually that I could command the, the, the same dollar value that I was making offline. And I can tell you that wasn't, um, lots of people were telling me I was a little bit crazy for thinking that, but um, it also gave me this like, in, you know, internal focus. And I can tell you like uh, my partner, she lives in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my daughters live here about four miles from my house, but I don't really have anyone here other than my daughter. So I split time with my kids. And uh, so for me, like right away, what I decided to do was I signed up and for every demo and every product um, that existed with the words virtual event. And actually it's over 70 of them that I ended up doing, um, 70 product demos. And it was like, you know, even though I played in this space, I wanted to know all of the technology possible, all of the, the, the constraints, all of the, the different things that were going on. And then I really wanted to see what was out there, to, what I could push. And for example, for me, when you say products, you mean? Every, so, every piece of software that put the word virtual event in their marketing, I was pretty much open. So for everything from a yeah. live streaming platforms to uh, like a virtual event registration, to webinars, to trade show software, um, to virtual presentation software, uh, even, you know, avatar, 3D, um, virtual reality, augmented reality tools. You know, I was really, for me, it was like, okay, if I can know what's possible, then I can start to build out a product that I believe can be just as valuable or if not, uh, more valuable. And I think for me, part of it also came into, you know, I love my speaker community. I love the, you know, it's my dream job. I, I really do uh, feel like I found my calling. And so part of it was this like commitment to like, you know what, if we have all of this attention on virtual, let's not let the 10 years of bad webinars yes. influence the future. Let's truly reinvent uh, what this all means. And so it's been an interesting you know journey for me. You know, I, was very lucky that I had some existing uh, partnerships that I could lean on and say, hey, I know you guys are, you know, building strategies. Do you want to bring me on for, you know, short-term retainers? Um, and then I also just decided, you know what, if if no one else is push, pushing the benchmark, I'm going to be the one uh, that pushes the benchmark. So I, you know, uh, started testing things out with three different cameras, uh, virtual overlays using uh, Prezi Video, um, using StreamYard, using uh, Ecamm. And really what I was going for was, you know, how do I you know, th this online audience, they're not a captured attention, right? Like as a speaker, I have like the greatest luxury in the world. I get on stage and people give me their attention. It's, yeah. it's I take it so much uh, pride in that. And that's yeah. why I, I will always deliver. But online, we know how it works, right? And and even virtual events, like I've, I have mean, I signed up for 10 webinars in March that I didn't plan on attending, right? Like I was like, I'll get the download, I'll, you know, whatever, you know, like I could care less. And I didn't want people to to put my content, my experience in that same bucket. And so it's been a, you know it's been a roller coaster. A lot of it became educating the market, mm -hmm. and then educating bureaus, and then educating events, all in the same time dealing with the, this emotional roller coaster that goes on. And and it's also you know it was bigger than I thought it was. You know I think we kind of had that feeling like. My brother works for PSAV, one of the largest audio video companies, and he does digital signage. And he was furloughed 
um, from his company. Um, I ended up reaching out to a couple of good friends in the space and they were, you know, in the event uh, food space. So they were supplying food for, you know, local events. They're out of business. And so as I started to look at it, I really wanted to approach it as not virtual experiences for speakers, but virtual experiences for everyone creating dynamic content, dynamic relationships online. And so that, that's been a big push, right? It's still, yeah. um, it's still, it's still, you know, one of those things too, where, you know, I, I actually tweeted this out yesterday. Like you have to be able to not only explain your value, but explain the problems you're solving and the value that for, you know, your clients, which I know all of us in this space, you know, completely understand, but when, they don't, when there's nothing to judge it against or what you have to judge it against isn't what you want your content to be judged against. Uh, you know, it does take a lot of different ever efforts. You know, I launched a brand new YouTube channel from, from scratch and everyone's like, what are you doing? And I was like, if I want to show that I'm committing to this type of content, I'm yep. not, I, I didn't want to take a shortcut, right? I want to be able to build something right. fresh in that space. Um, I can tell you, I've tried out, you know, all those demos, so many of them were painful. Um, and, you know, I started to really take stock into what questions I was asking, what questions they were asking me. And then also, I, you know, I think one of the bigger pieces, too, was I approached this. Uh, it was about the end of March, around March 30th. I just decided my, my business plan is addressing offline events as if I don't ever get a keynote for two more years. So what I was thinking was March of 2022 would be the first time I get a keynote. So if that's the case... I have three kids. I have, you know, a mortgage. I have child support. Founders support. take in that money planning strategy right now. That is huge. And, and when you and do that too, you're not like because I think for so many of us in this moment, it's like, what can I do to get us to tomorrow? Which is what we kind of have to live. But I didn't want to create a band aid, right? And I, and even like when I looked at it, when I said like, you know, I don't want to cannibalize my business that I've been building. I kept saying, you know what? This is my second revenue stream. It's not a Band-Aid. It's not going to cannibalize. It's not going to water down. But doing so makes me have to commit to not do things. And, and I can tell you, I'm not great at that. Um, and for those that this is one of my lessons, uh, self-awareness is essential. You need to know what you don't know so you can surround yourself with people who know what you don't. And I'm very blessed. I have the best speaker agent in the world. And just recently, even she came to me and she's like, I'm no longer allowing you to put anything on your calendar. Like I am, I am going to kidnap all of your time and someone's going to have to come through me. And, and, you know, and part of that was this, you know, for me, I was doing webinars, live stream interviews because it was building my offline business. Well, now my business has changed. I have to approach these things differently. Right. And so that's been a big, big piece for me. And I, and I think really it's helping me see that, that light of like, Hey, this is something new and exciting. And I, you know, I'm, I'm excited to where it's going to go. What I love and appreciate about what you did too is that you understood there was no time to waste. And even though you had all these years of experience as a speaker and all these years of experience of online communication, you knew for you to stand out with your brand, you needed to up your game, you need to do it quickly. And you went deep trying out all those different platforms, 70 software uh, packages, whatever tools, resources, it up to your game and now you've got a lived experience that you're going to be able to to capitalize on but the fact that you weren't like well we'll see what happens i'll hover no i watched you from day one you pivoted faster i mean i had a little whoo little wind from it it was so fast well and i can tell you part of the one of the residual benefits of that and i and i can tell you this was very conscious on my part was i knew to be successful, I needed to collaborate with event planners, event professionals, event managers. And in my speaker world, you know, I send my deck, I show up, somebody mics me, so I do a dry run and I'm off and running, right? And I've never claimed to be a master in those spaces. And so when I saw that virtual was gonna add more responsibility on my shoulders and require a much more fluid relationship, I immediately was like, ooh, if I all of a sudden just call myself a virtual event expert, I'm going to be the guy that I don't like when that happens in my own world, right? And so I said, how can I earn respect? How can I find avenues in? And I can tell you, getting on phone calls with different founders of all of these different tools and them going, no one's ever asked that, us that question before, Brian. Can we take down your information and do a follow-up call? And a follow-up call would be a CMO of these brands. And they're like, we would love to get you connected on this webinar with Salesforce and the webinar I just did uh, yesterday. And so it was so funny because... 
when people looked at it from the outside, you know, a lot of it was like Brian's, you know, going all in testing and, and pivoting. But I really consciously was like, I want to, I want to earn my stripes and I want to not be, and this is, this is me learning in my age. Like I used to have a tendency to disrupt for disrupting sake. And I learned that you have to be part of the game to change the game. And if you disrupt and you get locked on the outside, you cannot do anything, right? You get forced to really have to find a new path in. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to earn respect. I, I started celebrating new brands. I added new RSS feeds to all of my channels. Uh, really everyone that would reach out and say, Brian, this is perfect for you. I would say, what's one person in this industry that you think I should connect with? Can you inter introduce me? And that's not normally in my like nature, but it was part of this whole like, how do we pivot into something new? And I can tell you the the reception I get right now, like to work fast forward to March, uh, you know, the middle of March has been, I mean, amazing. But yeah. it would have been so different if I hadn't learned through many years of doing it differently. Uh, yeah. that, like building the, that rapport and you know, and, and really saying, hey, I'm not going to claim to know what I don't know, and and I'm gonna you know kind of come in there. And it's been it's been fun to see that uh, you know kind of benefit because i can tell you those numerous calls and emails and signing up uh, and there was plenty of times where i was like overwhelmed and not wanting to do it and i mean the 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 benefit now is you know is, well, is so it's worth it and it's easy to get caught up in the grief of how it was <laughs> and yes. you know the grief of wait a minute where did my income for the year go i had plans for that money <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> to answer your, Brad, you asked such a good question. And I think one of the greatest insights that Brian shared in the whole answer to your question about speaking engagements is that he's looking at March 2020. That is phenomenal practical because if it happens sooner, great. But in yep. the meantime, this is how you're going to earn it to win it. I love that. Now, Nikki has to go to bed. She's in the UK. So we're going to, she has a quick hands question for you. Um, do you think there will be more virtual conferences in the next few years, given that inbound has canceled due to COVID? So I'm a big believer that we will see hybrid events from now on. Um, I've also said that oh, June of 2022 um, will be the best offline events we've ever seen. I, I really believe that we're going to learn how to, foster trust and relationships 364 days a year and then we have that one day offline at an event it's the the content's gonna be richer the conversations are gonna be more dynamic we're gonna see more streamlined content more like choose your own adventure so i believe that the offline hybrid event is going to come but virtual is going to be here to stay and i'm excited to even see where we go beyond this right the idea of you know, content on demand, content creation, you know, even for, you know, some of the things that I'm working on, you know, every presentation that I give in a couple of these platforms, it's going to be available in audio format, a PDF, a transcript, and a video format, right? Therefore, you decide how you consume best. Don't let me dictate how you should learn from, from me. And I think we never had that opportunity offline. And I, and I really look at that as kind of like this new model. And so, you know, I think things like inbound, I, I've spoken inbound for years. Um, the, the thing about inbound, right, it's multiple days, one of the largest events. I mean, I we always love say, it. It's so much fun. <laughs> so much fun. But like I, most multiple people on my team would be like, I'm like, if you can't find my session, just go into a different one. Like there's so many sessions going on. But I think even that event, if you think about it, the idea where some of those workshops can go from a two hour workshop to a 30 minute workshop and an hour Q and A, because you're, you're giving us so much of that workshop content online. Um, it can be pretty you know amazing in, in that sense. And so I do look at virtual as here for the future, but it, I think it's going to, we're going to redefine virtual and in, because of that virtual is going to redefine what a hybrid event uh, looks like. And I think that excites me. You know, I've made a prediction, like I don't want to see, you know, slides and projection screens at big events anymore, right? If we're if we're figuring out how to broadcast and use overlays and graphics online, let's create virtual backgrounds and digital displays that allow us to do that on stages. And I, and I think that. we're gonna be up for that challenge as well. I love that and I love the word hybrid. Oh, something fierce. So this is a question that Nick has because part of this, the Founders Live event is the networking aspect. The, you know, we don't use name tags at our live events and people, you know, we just, it's so easy to build community in these events because we start off with a happy hour for an hour before we go into the pitch event and this ability to connect. So we've been trying to figure out and Nick's been trying to figure out how do we have that moment where we can connect 
not in a boring Zoom, not where we have to rely on one person to keep the conversation going. So great question, Nick Hughes. And what, yeah, do you, what are your thoughts about networking platforms where people can meet? Because we have Meet Away here in Boston, which I'm a huge fan of. But um, what are your thoughts? So I think this is one. I think it's one of the hardest things to solve in the virtual mm -hmm. space, right? The idea, you know, uh, the screen will automatically put distance between us, and the level of comfort for everybody being on video also adds a, a new level of restraint, new level of hesitation, even how we introduce ourselves. And honestly, I think you know when when we look at like a Zoom and the idea that one person has to um, facilitate, I would actually argue that if you can set up swim lanes for, and it's the way I like to set up, instead of rules or instead of structure, you know, defined structure, if you can set up swim lanes and multiple options for people to facilitate and, and manufacture conversation, the platform matters a little bit less. And what I mean by that is, you know, having a host or having multiple hosts, being able to use multiple breakouts and structure different uh, environments, but also letting people kind of pick and choose as they go, you know, I, um, and, it's not a good platform answer, but Microsoft just recently did an event for their partners and they had 4,000 partners. Um, and for the two day event, get this, they had a hundred or 819 breakout rooms, 4,000 people, two days. And what the reasoning was, was they structured each piece of content, each piece of, you know, zoom room or that kind of um, conversation in different, like niche down, very focused. Some of them you had to, uh, you had to attend these three things before you can be enabled into this group, right? That, that idea of kind of like exclusivity. And so I think when I look at this whole the networking dynamic on in the virtual space, I think one of the things to kind of to foster that and kind of grow things forward is having multiple different options for people to to network everything from audio only to, you know, video like you would see in a Zoom or even the idea of you know, one of the things I think that you know, TikTok and even Snapchat has taught us is we're a lot more comfortable giving answers without having to see someone's instant reaction. Live streaming scares a lot of people, mostly because they know that the commenter can see our reaction and they know the person interviewing them, they can see it. And so figuring out ways to kind of switch that dynamic. Um, there's a couple of event platforms. One's called Tame Events. Uh, T-A-M-E, Tame Events is one of the ones that is working on the ability to even go from, if you don't want video, you can have an avatar. If you don't want an avatar, you can create and listen to uh, virtual you know, uh, virtual messages. Uh, one of the events I would listen to, uh, was a part of today, uh, they're using hub, a platform called Hub, H-U-B-B. -B. And uh, right now, actually, I believe is going on, they're doing a, a Netflix party, a watch party. And I thought what was interesting is they're having a group version of it. But then they also have a group that are all watching it and using a forum chat room just to chat about it that didn't want to be on video, but still wanted to participate in that kind of thing. So I don't believe the technology is there. I think the places to look for inspiration are Twitch. Twitch has the greatest community there is, the longest amount of watch time, the most engaged users. I mean, I've probably studied, I'm not a gamer at all, uh, 60 hours of Twitch in the last three months because... I really wanted to understand how do they facilitate conversation? How do they playing a game and still keep people engaged? And, and you know, they do a lot of things that are like, you might not even expect where they'll turn their chair, even with a green screen towards the, the camera when they're planning on answering questions and engaging. They don't have to say it, but they're using that body language. When they turn back, you almost see the room start chatting with each other immediately. The questions stop. And a lot of that has to do with that that culture and that community right. built over there. And so I think we can take those kind of lessons sure. and, inter and, and, and you know, interact them into different uh, places. You know, I, I did a Zoom uh, last week where we tested out multiple breakout rooms that were speed breakout rooms and like send them in for 10 minutes, pull them back out, send them in for, and they were rotating and random. And I can tell you, I originally felt uncomfortable because uh, as much comfortable as I am live video and holding courts, uh, forced conversation has always been something that I don't enjoy. Like I always joke, like people on the airplane, they'll, they'll get off the airplane and like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, keynote speaker, social media influencer. And they're like, you didn't talk to me for one second that entire <laughs> flight. And I'm like, cause I didn't care about the weather. And like, it's like, you're like, you have to like, you have to yeah. also- You have to, you have to be on purpose person. when you're talking. Yes. Well, and, and for me, part of it too, is that like, 
you know, it's that mutual, you know, beneficial, right? Like I right. want it to be, you know, back and forth. And so I don't okay. believe there isn't a, a direct answer. You know, Facebook groups is not the answer, but I, I do believe very structured, uh, you know, let's just say swim lanes from the beginning and someone that is able to manage a Facebook group out of the, the start can be very successful for fostering, um, you know, different kinds of uh, engagement. I'm, I'm part of one now that is slowly growing, but they're allowing everyone to go live in the group, which scared me at first. I was like, oh my goodness. But what it's actually done is it, it it's almost becomes piggyback where someone will tag someone else in and they'll be like, hey, I'm gonna jump off. Who in the chat wants to jump on a Facebook Live? And it's created this interesting, um, you know, viral type connectivity. Yeah. And it, I can tell you, it's not a marketer's group. It's because it's, if it was a marketer's group, there'd be a lot of links dropped and a lot of, right. a lot of, a lot of self-promotion. Um, <laughs> but the, the group itself is, you know, is learning ways to kind of um, inspire, you know, right. unique collaboration, but uh, it's an and interesting problem. Ryan, check out Meet Away. So I was part of the Techstars uh, Startup Weekend. I was one of the mentors. And so for us to get to know the other mentors, they set up Meet Away, which is where we could have one, two, three people in the room. Meet Away, you just signed up, put in your LinkedIn information, your headshot, a little bit about yourself, and they coordinated. So it was like speed dating. So you'd oh. get into the room. Hi, how are you? What are you doing? Where do you live? Oh, no kidding. This is my, oh, that's great. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, that kind of thing. And right. then a little box would pop up and say, hey, it's time to move on. Are you ready? You can wait if you want. And if you want to wait, fine. They'll get you the next round. And you can spend another 10 minutes or five minutes oh. talking. Otherwise, they send you off. Very cool. I want, can we say hi for a second to one of our favorite goddesses out oh, there? The queen of Google Hangouts. They're, they're, that's the one that inspired me to do Google Hangouts back in the day. Absolutely. <laughs> Mia, so good to see you. Thank you for tuning in. We've got some great folks tuning in tonight. That was a great question, Nick. I really like what April said here, the, her last sentence. I say that content is not king. The content provider is king. Wow. Yeah, That's that, it's easy to create content these days and it's easy to put content out there. It's really hard to get content in front of the right people at the right time, right? That's the that's the that's the magic sauce that you know everyone's working hard at. I agree, Mia. Just another shout out to our goddess gal here. Um and uh but you know, this whole managing and you know, we've seen it everybody. And there's I believe there was a grace period while we all were like, what lockdown, huh? And the Zoom meetings, and you know, you see nine million boxes, all these photos. But you know, it's how do you get people to who are actually leading these events to you know really up their game, get some good lighting, get some good audio. It's one thing, and I just want to tell everybody who's view watching now, if you don't know this, Brian has no power in his home, and he showed up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> a battery pack is running his his <laughs> ring light. <laughs> Literally, my, my ring light is plugged into a battery pack. So, uh, <laughs> and, and he got his phone out. And that's the beauty of StreamYard. Thank you, StreamYard. They take phones. It's so, so wonderful. And uh, and so, but I really think at a certain point, you've got to stop these boring, there's not enough coffee or sugar to keep me awake. Zoom webinars, meetings, and events. And I don't know how to gently tell people, you've got to up your game. I mean, as you said, we could be at this for quite a while. And this is unacceptable. When you're online, folks, people can disappear in a heartbeat. When you've got them in a room, they're captured. They're, you, you know, they might be looking at their phones, but that's about it. You've pretty much got them there. So now we have got to create an opportunity where we people will stick around, talk amongst themselves, or at least through a webinar not fall asleep in their chair. What do yeah, you think? You know, I think that you know, for me, this comes down to, we don't have all of a sudden more attention, right? Because we have everyone at the same time, but we have to be more strategic with the attention that we're commanding, yeah. right? If we are telling you that tuning in for this is worth your time, we need to be intentional with our actions, the content we're providing. And I will make the argument, and I've said this even as a speaker, that I believe a virtual host is more valuable for to a, an event than any speaker or any piece of content, right? The the face, the, the connectivity, the one that helps you roll the punches when things go wrong, and to be a good host. And I mean, anyone. I mean, I, I did 480 episodes of my Google Plus Hangout show uh, back in the day with my Twitter chat, and uh, you know, Mia was in here. And I remember for me, interviewing someone, having a co-host, bringing in Twitter chat questions, being able to facilitate a conversation, manage that whole world. 
I mean, it's when your guest disappears, keeping the conversation going. Yes, right. And, and like, and even being, and this is that piece too, where we have to be authentic and real, but that does not give us an excuse to be lazy and unprepared, right? And I think we've got into this spot where I, I loved seeing the CEO uh, of Microsoft, you know, in his you know jeans, he was in a t-shirt and he presented in front of his like uh, master bedroom doors. It was beautifully lit. It was, it was so well done. And then it was so funny. I saw all of these people being inspired and they were doing it like camera off angle, light over their shoulder, showing like, you know, hole in the shirt and barely, you know, giving eye contact. And I was like, wait a second, just because you're, you're, you're shifting doesn't mean you can go in this other piece. And, and I think that includes knowing how to carry a conversation, but also listen and read body language, right? Like one of the things I, I tell people, you know, for I moderate and host a lot of offline events is that, you know, I won't moderate a panel unless everyone on my panel has a microphone. And everyone's like, what? And I talk with my hands. So like microphone's not my friend. Um, but the reason is, is because when we say we want something to be conversational, we say we want something to be, you know, engaged and, and loose, but we don't give people ways to signal to each other that they want to jump in or they have something to say, it becomes the person that talks fastest and the, the most, which is usually me, um, that controls the conversation. And that's not a good thing. And so in the Zoom world, it's the same way, right? Being able to manage expectations, let people know, I need to know you're going to jump in. I need to know you want to join the conversation. And by doing so, we can become better listeners. You know, even you know, with my podcast, I always have the microphones you know, up on the screen and, and everyone's like, well, why do we have the camera on? It's like, I want to see you lean into the microphone because you're about to jump in on me. And then me as a host knows when to shut up, right? Which for right. some might be surprising because I'm not giving Andy a chance here. But like, and I think that's kind of the beauty too of that hosting skill set. It is the only way you get good at it is through repetition and practice. Practice, practice, and, practice. Oh, and it's such a, like to me, it's everything, right? Like I will watch, like, so one of the things that, uh, if anybody watched the documentary of Michael Jordan, this the, uh, the, the last, last season, dance. The yeah, last dance, yeah. With our I, Celtic, I, Larry Bird. Oh, it was, it was amazing. And, and Larry Bird definitely was, uh, it was fun to see that go back and forth. But one of the things I found so compelling after the last episode aired this Sunday, I watched an interview with the, the document, the, the gentleman who uh, built the documentary. And he said he got three one hour sit downs with Jordan total. Every player gave him 30 minutes one time. He was able to get 10 hours of content that was never narrated by someone that wasn't an interview. And what I started thinking about was, and, and this is how much of a geek I was, I went back and started watching episode one through three again, and I started writing down what I thought their answers were. Because of course, they cut out the, the question from, um, you know, from him and they just, you know, get the answer from the guest. And I thought, I, I was amazed at the, the, my looking at it and saying, wow, they set him down a path, but I know that they had to allow the freedom for the conversation to go there. And then I wonder what that follow-up question was. And if, if we can think about that, like anytime you watch a show, a documentary, I mean, I'm, I'm very methodical in trying to learn always how to be a better interviewer, a better listener, better on video. And you know, the cool part about this is for start, especially for founders out there, like I, I love, I have like a soft spot because I work with a lot of big brands that don't have great storytellers, don't have a, you know, they have a very old stuck in their way story. And I try to get them to do what I want them to do. But those that are doing this for their passion, their, I mean, you're not doing this, you know, unpredictable world for anything other than like, you have a dream, you have a purpose, problems you want to solve, you get up excited about what you're doing, you go to bed excited. You're the people that need to embrace this more so than every, anything else because oh your path will rocket ship because you have good stories. You're a good person doing good things and the world just needs to hear it. And I think that's where I look at all of this going, right? It's, it's not about having less Zooms. It's about having better Zoom hosts and for us to be better participants, right? Like it's no excuse anymore to leave your microphone unmuted when you are in a massive group. Like it, that, that is such, it's such disrespect to everything that goes on. And I understand if you didn't know you could mute yourself, but the first time you're corrected, it is no longer an excuse, right? And like, even like my parents, my mom was like, oh, I can just tap the space bar. I was like, yeah, mom. She's like, why is it a big deal with no one knowing how to mute themselves? I was like, it's a great question, Molly. And, and so I think that's, like, if we look at all of these things moving parts, we're being forced into a new world, which is difficult and scary. I'm not saying any of this is easy, right. but I am saying that 
we can be more strategic because when we do get that little bit of attention from our audience, we better do something of value. We better not waste people's time because I hear this all the time, right? This generation has the short attention span. And I think that's complete crap. We just yep. have no time for crappy content. Exactly. And so if we believe you are a deliverer of crappy content or a, 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 a video that's a disguised sales pitch white paper, we will immediately block you out. And that's where we have to move forward and understand when we, how we build that relationship. When's a good time to sell? Like I got an amazing video email today um, from someone that it was our fifth touch point. And on the fifth touch point, it was a video, you know, a bomb bomb video email. And I can tell you, I watched the whole thing, took notes, and I was like, I'm going to follow up about their services. And they could have done that any of the times prior. And more than likely, I don't even open that email. And instead, they did it this way. And it's a, you know, it's a company and brand that was traditionally offline. And I, and I think that's one of the things that we can also learn is like, how do we, how do we understand how to be strategic with all of these different touch points in the virtual world? Because just because we have more of them doesn't mean we should use all of them whenever we want. Speaking of touch points, one of your incredible superpowers is digital empathy. So tell people about digital empathy and how we can do that more in our posts because you know it's a harsh world out there right now. People think just because they have this buffer that nobody can see them. I mean, this is not virtual world, but in, on our, in digital marketing, we're just seeing so much harshness out there that we just wanna go, oh, why bother? How can, founders and their startups keep showing up with the right attitude, but with the right empathy for whomever their group is in their audience. So I think, you know, empathy is an interesting one, especially because, it, you know, to, to, to have empathy, we have to be able to feel what the other person is feeling, walk in their shoes, understand where their you know point of view is coming from. And in the virtual world, especially the digital world, and live video being the, the biggest culprit, when someone has the ability to say nasty things or be a troll or a bully, and they can get an instant reaction, it empowers something in them that they can't get anywhere else, right? When someone comments bad on a blog or even replies to a tweet, they don't see what our reaction is. But on live video, they do, and on these platforms there is. So when we look at empathy and how I approach digital empathy is that right now we have bad news and fake news, and then I would argue we have corona news, right? So we have three things that are filtering and, and, and polluting our world. And unfortunately, we spend a lot of time on each one of those things. But we hear a good story about someone in our community or our client, and we give that one minute, and we give 59 minutes of our attention to a fake news story or something that we get you know, the bad news. And I think when I look at digital empathy, this is where I believe we have to start looking at it ourselves and make a conscious effort to not only put ourselves out there, but to spend more time amplifying the good around us, right? The, we are not gonna cut through the noise by trying to break down the fake news, right? Like I, I always say like, no innovation, no technology will fix stupid or stop bad people from doing bad things, right? Like the most innovative things are, are amazing because they enable freedom and things that we never could dream of, but that also enables someone to do something that they never knew was possible that could be bad or nasty. And so I, my challenge for everyone that I always, kind of work in this space is that if we want to make the world a more empathetic place, and that sounds very overwhelming. Like when someone's like, do you want to change the world? We all say yes. But then we like run around like, where do we start? And it just seems too big. Right. And I think empathy, we can switch that on its head. And, and what I mean by that is we have to start asking ourselves, how am I allowing other people to be empathetic towards me? How am I giving someone access in to understand my pain, understand my stories? You'll, you'll notice like in my pivot, I've been very transparent in the business I've lost, the things I don't know, the, the struggles I had being isolated for my, my kids for 14 days. Um, that, that isn't the idea of like me trying to force authenticity, but rather it's understanding, like, hey, I want you to know where I'm coming from with every one of my opinions. Know where I stand. And it doesn't mean you have to agree, but more often than not, if we can put ourselves in the shoes and we can understand that where that feeling is rooted, we can at least stop judging and stop, you know, un and start understanding. And I think that's one of the big things that we can do moving forward. And I mean, the world right now has never been more divided, right? I mean, it's it's amazing. Even wearing a mask and not wearing a mask all of a sudden became political. And I was like, how is that even possible? Awesome. But but if we if we think about this, like, and, and this is something for me is like, I truly do. Like, I am, you know, I love everyone for every decision they make, as long as you're not harming others. 
I'm a big supporter in, in anyone and everyone doing um, what makes them happy. But I also look at it and, and, and try to look at this from a, a bigger picture and say, you know what? If we can surround ourselves in our community and start being more transparent, allowing people in to understand who we are, one of the things I think coronavirus should teach us is that we are way more alike than we are different. Like everyone, it does not matter who you are, where you are in the country, what your job was, uh, you, you were impacted by the stay at home or the social distancing, or you knew of somebody. And so if we can remember that our vulnerabilities, the things that we do wrong, the, thing, the mistakes that we make are just as much what people connect with as it is our success, we can leverage that, right? Because Michael Jordan, we, we just talked about the documentary, Oprah Winfrey, Steve Jobs, we've heard the stories, right? Uh, you know, not able, told she would never be on TV. Steve Jobs fired from his own company. Michael Jordan cut from the basketball team. But interestingly enough, we heard those failure stories after they were successful. And I look at it today in the world we're living in now, it can't be after you're successful. Because if we want to lift each other up, we need to let people know that they're not alone. The suicide rate should be going down, not up right now. And part of that is this idea of saying, hey, this is me, I'm human. No, don't judge me for it, but this is where I'm coming from. And I believe we're getting there. And I believe that to me is where I, I drive my optimism and my positivity for coming out of this. Because the thing that excites me, and you know, I have a 10 year old, an eight year old and a six year old. The thing that excites me about the future the most is that we get to shape the future now together. Like we didn't, we didn't get a choice to do that before, but we get to decide from this moment forward what we prioritize, who we care about, the time we spend places. And if we're all willing to do that for the greater good, we have an amazing opportunity, but it does require us to be empathetic, right? Just because we disagree on certain things doesn't mean um, that we can't get along. And that's a tough, tough road to haul. I, I, I said this six months ago, uh, the thing that scared me the most was you know, November of, of 2020. Little did I know that the start of 2020 would be a completely different world. And, and it wasn't because of one political decision or the other, it was just our, our, our inability to understand you know, how to relate with other people that disagree with us. But I look at the you know, virtual, digital, social media as that great equalizer, right? We, we were before we were inundated with all of this and kind of we're, we're forced to kind of handle it the way someone else told us to. But right now you have the ability to connect with anyone in the world and tell your story in any way that you're comfortable if you're willing to do it. And if you if you truly do want to change the world and make it more empathetic, it starts with each one of us individually putting ourselves out there. And, and, part, and thank you for that, Brian. Seriously, that was so heartfelt. And I was really touched by where you went with that. And this is what we have to do. You know, startup founders, especially, we see the big brands and how they play ball. And they're coming from a different marketing game. We need to connect. And when you're starting a business, it is never, in my opinion, Brian, you can jump in about what you might be posting. It's about hopping on to other people's threads and showing the love and the reciprocity and being excited about what they're doing. And commenting with the commenters so that they'll come back. How are we doing this now that we're moving forward? Because I really, you know, you are a digital futurist. We as founders, you know, we're managing a lot of innovation in our lives, no matter what we're doing, whether it's food or life sciences, tech, SaaS, whatever, electronic consumer products. We are on the cutting edge, always creating new space. It's hard to manage too this piece of marketing of digital connecting. What are your thoughts when you know a new business is getting out there? They've launched their Facebook, their Twitter, maybe they're going on Twitch, maybe they're going on YouTube, whatever, LinkedIn, of course. How can they be more digitally empathetic, not just about their posts, but how they reach out and connect with other folks? So I always say like the secret to success is showing you care more than others. And when I say show you care, that means when you're applying or engaging with somebody, it's not just saying thank you or I appreciate you or hey, can I get on your email list? It's taking a step further, clicking on their profile, clicking on the link, see what their most recent blog post was. Go to their Facebook account, see what's something that they just posted about, bringing that conversation, caring, going a little bit further, right? Anyone can retweet, anyone can send an email. And you know, especially when you're trying to get in, you know, let's say a large brand or maybe a big influencer or, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk was always a great example of, you know, Gary would get thousands of tags in his, uh, of people like, Gary, please mention me. Gary, please reply to my email. Gary, please let me know what's going on. 
And the people he started to follow back, the people he engaged with, were people that not only celebrated his content, but would mention him in a way of like, hey, this is a great person, a resource, or this is something we agree with. And there's also people that disagree. Yeah? And Gary, uh, thankfully for me, you know, reached out to me in 2013 uh, at South by Southwest. And he pulled me aside and we, we ended up having this great talk. But he started off by saying, Brian, do you know how I started paying attention to you? I was like, no, I was like Twitter. You know, I had like my, I was like, of course, Twitter. So, and he was like, you actually disagree with me more than you agree with me. And you did it in a positive way. And I was like, well, I know that people are following me for my opinion, not for just me rebuting, you know, to, you know, recycling your opinion. And I also have always kind of believed in like, I don't have to, you know, treat someone differently and, you know, bow down. And so I think when founders look at that, find ways to care more and get on their radar by less selling and more caring. And a good example for that was, you know, in 2016 for me, um, I worked really hard uh, trying to be a host for Dell uh, Technology World, big Dell event in Austin, Texas. Um, I, I had been to the event a couple of times and I had hosted an IBM event and I had hosted an SAP event. And uh, I ended up getting turned down and they said, Brian, you're, you have a lot of IBM in your feed and you have a lot of SAP in your feed and you're a little bit too you know, brash for us right now. Like check back in, like it's just not gonna work for us right now. And when I heard that, so many of my friends in my circle were like, oh, man, you're going to teach them a lesson. You're going to show them you're wrong. And I was like, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do everything I would have done if they would have hired me. And I'm going to do it without ever making an ask. And I said, I'm, gonna, I'm committed to getting on that stage and hosting that event. And I can tell you, 2017, I hosted you know, Dell Technology World. And the funny thing about it was the comment came through a LinkedIn message. And they said, Brian, we've never had someone support, share our content, celebrate what we're doing, give us encouragement and not not make that ask, What? how can we get you on that stage this year? I didn't have to pitch, I didn't have to sell. I got what I wanted by simply caring more. And I and I can tell you, I went so far deep is that every month I would do a video on LinkedIn. I wouldn't tag them in it, but I would see what they were blogging about. And my video topic was the topic that was the theme of their blog post, right? Knowing enough to know that like, hey, I'm gonna show that, hey, we're aligned, but I'm not doing it with like, Hey, Dell, look, see, don't you know that I like the same things? And so that's my challenge for everyone that's out there is it's not about trying to knock on, like, please give me attention. It's rather, how can you care so much that they can't help but give you that attention? And it's, it's trust me, I can tell, I mean, Andy, you're, you're, you're coming, ask me to come on the show. Um, you didn't even have to do a video. You simply could have sent me a message and you went above and beyond. But part of it was we've engaged and connected for so long. Yeah. That social equity is built up. I would have said yes in a heartbeat, no matter what. And I can tell you the the 13 people I said no to in the last two weeks, it was because they didn't, right? It was the, oh, I saw you doing virtual event stuff. I need you on my show. Or I even had the worst case. Someone pitched me about hiring me to speak. They chose someone else and then said, would you do a three-part interview series on our brand channel for free? And we want you to talk about the same thing as your keynotes, but do it in an interview. And I was like, are now. you really doing that right and so i, I think andy you i mean it was to me i that watching that video that you that you made you know asking me to be on the show not only did it make me excited about being on the show but you know when the, when the power went out and i can tell you that shadow behind me is very <laughs> annoying i'm not used to having any shadows i know i know but i was i, I trust me i was gonna go i was gonna go find a street lamp to make sure that i was on the show even if i couldn't yeah. get it to work because uh, because of that that connection right and i think for startups and founders, like that's the piece. And also like, you know, influencers and those that are in your circle, it doesn't have to be a big name. I always tell people like, think back before the internet. If you could say, you're gonna reach one new potential customer every single day, 365 new potential customers every day, would you have signed up for it? Hell yes, like in a heartbeat. And so because you can go viral, because you can reach the world, probably doesn't even mean you should. And I think if you start looking at like, okay, who are my biggest fans? How can I empower them? What are my customers or people that I can partner with? How can I align those forces? I mean, I really don't think, I don't believe that you have, like you get on that big radar by doing all of those small things really, really well. And that's the companies that we're seeing succeed. And you know, even the brands that I support on my channels, a lot of people are asking me like, Brian, like how did they get on your radar? I was like, they continue to support me, engage, 
comments. Okay. They didn't. They didn't ask me for my email the, the, before they even followed me on Instagram, right? Like they they built such a rapport. Like the the ring light that I'm using, it's from Iographer. The name of the company is Iographer. And when the founder of Iographer found out that I w was looking for a new tripod, he sent me a Snapchat. He didn't even have Snapchat. Created a Snapchat account. He's on his honeymoon. He sends me a Snapchat video and says, Brian, I heard you're in the mood for a tripod. I'm going to send you one. I'm on my honeymoon. He like shows his new wife sitting in a palm tree. And he's like, if you can hold off until I get back, I got you. That was five years ago. Five years ago, I still use his products, promote his products, tag it twice today in the Instagram video. There's never been a financial relationship. He sends me free it. gear. I support that. And it was simply because he cared more than any other brand. All the big brands are willing to send me free tripods. He was willing to go that step further. I mean, Dave from Iographer, just check out Iographer. They're an amazing brand, amazing company. I'll, I'll sure I mean, have that we'll, we'll, we'll see that. That's the ring light. So you can see I have a big ring light that, of course, powers out. This is a little bit portable um, ring light. They do tripods. They do cases for your um, your iPhone. But it's a neat. That is every founder can just take that. Think about that and say, how can I stand out and show someone that I care so much about them and what they care about that they're going to have nothing better to do than to care about me. And what Brian has said is so true. It's how I've met so many of the influencers, just really just sharing the love right behind me here. You know, we've got Arlen Hamilton as part of her book launch team. It's about time. Oh, yes. I love this woman. I found out about her in 2018. I just couldn't get enough of her. And I just shared and contributed, et cetera. And then so I was able to join her book launch team and was so honored to interview her on my podcast. So honored to have you. And I sent the video, Brian, and, and for viewers, this is what happened is Brian had tweeted and I really honored how he just sort of put it out there. Look, folks, this is one of my primary revenue streams. You didn't have to say, and I've got a family to feed. Hello. <laughs> Don't pay for free virtual speaking engagements. It's just never going to happen. And I thought, well, you know, I want to honor the fact that he's doing this, but I do still want to have him on the show because, you know, we can get him to talk to our founders, because most of the founders I work with, Brian, are underrepresented, underserved, underestimated, and they are bootstrapping their booties off. Yeah. And so having this moment and be able to turn to this piece of content, when I'm working with clients, when I'm doing DIY advice, when I'm mentoring, to be able to send this, because this will be evergreen for months and years, to be able to send this to them and introduce them to you means the world to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. For, for all of that. Let's just, you know, as we wrap up the show, let's talk a little bit about first, how do you, like, where do you go for, for solace and also, you know, the mindset that's keeping you going through, not just this COVID time, but, you know, we all have life that happens while we're building our businesses and we can't like, you know, just put it off to the side. Like you might, if you're on payroll, yeah, we have a lot of responsibility. So where do you turn? How, what soothes your heart and soul? And then we want to hear about how we can support you. So, you know, I love that question because one of the things that I've always struggled with was when people would tell me like certain things, like five things billionaires would do before 5 a.m. And I was like, oh, I, I want to be a billionaire. I need to do that. And I think one of the things that I think we all are learning right now is that we have to be okay with not being okay during certain times. And we also have to be okay with finding our own way of, of, of kind of what works for us, right? I'm, I'm not a reader. I was diagnosed uh, ADHD at, at 31 years old. I have read more books in the last seven years of my life than the first 31. Um, but, you know, reading books is not, is actually more of a chore for me than uh, anything else. Interestingly enough, I don't even a, a video consumer. I'm more of a podcast listener um, than anything else, although I create a lot of video content. And so for me, kind of figuring out, you know, what works for me, how to, like, you know, assign things. And so, you know, interestingly enough, like I started to hear, you know, and actually this is another one, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk would say, if you have time for Netflix, you're, you're not working, not working hard. And I started to take that on. And then I realized the net watching Netflix or streaming TV allowed me to give my brain a break. It allowed me to stop overthinking things, um, especially if someone with ADHD, that's, that is a, you know, the reason I am medicated is for that reason. I couldn't, turn my light, my brain off at night. I think we, we can all <laughs> <You're right now. laughs> and so like, even when I, I have a notebook that sits next to me while I watch TV because I, I need to get things out of my head. Yeah. And I started to be, I started to actually recognize that spending that time 
watching my favorite TV shows or binge watching, uh, and I watch a wide range of things, was actually part of my productivity recipe, right? Part of the thing that actually made me better at what I was doing. The other piece of it was the whole idea of working nine to five. You know, it, it exists because of some, you know, the archaic power grid and the idea you know, of farmers and, and electricity. And I, I think as entrepreneurs, as founders, you know, we, we have this ability to carve out our own work week. But one of the things I learned early on when I started working from home is out of sight, out of mind, and having work always there gives us this feeling of never turning it off, right? And we we are always, like, if we're not doing something, we feel guilty for not doing it. When we're doing everything, we wish we didn't have some time. And so one of the things that I worked really hard on last year was I, I even did a time-lapse video every day for a month of what what was I when was I most productive in the day? When did I when did I like doing certain tasks? And then I adjusted my schedule. I can tell you more often than not, the hours between about one and four p.m. I'm on the couch watching something on TV and kind of vegging out because I learned how unproductive and how frustrated I was during those hours. And then the hours between seven and eleven, I'm grinding out doing work without a problem. And so I think. For each one of us out there, we have to look at that because if you're able to be very self-aware, and I, I mean, it's the no, I always thought I was, because I was self-confident, I assumed I was self-aware. I learned quickly. There's two of those things that are not, uh, you know, they're, they, they are definitely can be separate. And part of it ends up being like, where do you get your energy from? When, like, I hate email. I despise email. I always have for whatever reason. And I start now. I carve out time on my calendar for email and I make sure that this is when I do it. And it's usually when I'm most passionate and most fired up because I can get on and do this at any hour of the day. Replying to an email at, during 1 to 4 p.m. was not my piece. Uh, and then the other thing of it is open your mind to learning from things that you would never imagine you would learn from, right? And I mentioned the documentaries. That became something for me that I was like, I want to be a better storyteller and speaker. And I started to even trying to, and this is how geeky I would get, is I would look at the description of a new documentary and I would write down five things that I expect the documentary to cover. And then I would watch the documentary and I would ask myself, did those five things happen? And if they didn't, why? And then like, why did I, was I led to believe that in that you know, pre-show marketing? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, what, what, what went into that? And, and, I, and I think for me, it was like, I found a way to do something I loved and make it beneficial in, in other ways and kind of serve me in, in those things. And so I, I feel like that's a, a big piece, especially right now where, you know, working from home is so hard. And so, I mean, it is the- oh, Listen, I miss your IG feed of every airport, every place you were, every city. Hey folks, here I am. And I'd be like living vicariously through you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, and that was the beauty too. Right? I even built my life that way. My girlfriend lives yeah. in Atlanta and we were seeing each other every other week because if I didn't have my kids, I would just stay in Atlanta and, and all of a sudden lockdown, I haven't seen her since March 10th, right? And and like when you think about all of these things and going through a new force, I was just forced to have to move uh, on June 1st. I have to move uh, houses, unfortunately, because of my landlord. And I think when I look at all of those things, I can tell you, it got me down. I don't, I, there's plenty of days and hours where I get frustrated. And in this current environment, the frustration exists everywhere, right? You go to the yeah. bathroom, you're like, oh, I got toilet paper. Oh yeah, I forgot we had a toilet paper shortage and you get like frustrated. You go out the front door and you're like, why isn't there traffic? Oh yeah, we're social distancing, right? Where am I getting my food? But all of these things. But I do believe that if you have if you if you can assign yourself things in your day and your week that you know make you better. I don't care what it is. It could be whatever it is for you. It doesn't have to be what other people feel. It allows you to kind of like reground and reattach yourself to those things and kind of move forward. And then I think the last piece of advice I can give on that is. This is a mistake I made really early on in my in my you know founder journey was I started to become friends with so many people in my industry, influencers, big name people. And I started to realize I allowed all of them to influence my decisions and my strategy. And I started to, to realize that there was a lot of my peers, a lot of people that I considered close friends that don't have the same vision of success that I do. They don't want to do this business the way that I want to do business. And I needed to shrink my circle of who could influence me on a business level 
to the sense of, hey, this person can still be my friend. I can still look up to him as a mentor. But if they're going to put out a statement saying virtual events are useless, it's a Band-Aid, anyone that's promoting it is not worth the while, I have to realize where that's coming from in their business strategy and what they believe in, respect, even if I disagree, and allow this. And so I shrunk my circle in about October of last year really small to, to assign, hey, these are people that they, they know my success. They know mm -hmm. my long-term goals and business dreams and yeah. values. And I'm going to allow them to influence in their decisions. But these other people, I'm still going to follow them because I don't believe in an echo chamber, right? We still right. need to have outside voices. But I need I, I, had, I had to de-escalate or I had to weigh the, their opinions less. And I can tell you, oh my goodness, it was the one of those freeing things that I ever did. Because now I can scroll my Instagram feed and although a friend is saying something differently, I, it does not impact me because I'm like, oh, that's an interesting opinion. I wonder where they got that from. And I move on. Where right. before I was like, oh my God, I just built a strategy out and create that kind of content. I need to stop that. And I would go back and try to fix it. And then like, I stopped chasing my own success and started allowing too much of that influence. Oh so, yeah, can, we, can we just take that in, everybody? We see all these different ways. Try, you know, do it this way. This is the best way. Do it that way. This is the best way to do it. And it can be so overwhelming. This is, again, we go, as Brian has said many times, the self-awareness, but also really honing in on what success looks like for you. Yes. And that is completely different than anybody else around. And you can't be swayed by that because the people who are going to get up at five work, you know, really totally you into that 20 hour day. Those aren't my peeps. <laughs> and that is a sure. success for me. And, uh, and if people think that you've got to have a unicorn uh, startup or you're not valuable, forget them. That's absolutely not true. You're valuable for getting up in the morning for crying out loud. Brian, how may we support you in your work in the world? I'm going to pop your links into the comments here and so that we everybody can follow you wherever you glow. I'm serious, everybody. You get out there. You follow this man. He is amazing. Whether his success and strategies are different from yours, you will always know that he is empathetic and he is thinking about how you can up your game digitally and right now in this whole vi um, virtual presence. As his quote, you know, that I've been sharing all over the place, Brian, your quote of to get your background and you to be the best you in what you're doing. I may not have done that quote very well, but anyway, how do we support Brian Fanzo? Sure, so you know, I'm on every social network, which I always say I don't want everyone to be on there, but I'm on everyone so that I can help people understand this platform. So just give me a follow on your favorite one. Don't follow me everywhere. I create a lot of content, um, no doubt about that. Uh, but yeah, iSocial fans, uh, my speaker site and all of my virtual content is up there on my uh, my website, brianfanzo.com. Uh, if you want to check out the new YouTube channel, which is all about virtual, it's not just for speakers, but virtual event, virtual conversations. Um, if you just put in your browser, uh, press the damn button dot video it'll redirect you to the youtube channel so press the damn button um dot video uh, i have some things you know kind of in the works coming out you know this summer with you know a new email newsletter that i'll be launching uh hopefully i will finally press the damn button on my book which has been uh in the works for for far too long uh but I, you know i think that for me the the piece that i think that we can all you know that you can help me on is that i do look at it as if each one of us find ways to care about others a little bit more and are willing to put ourselves out there. Like I'm extremely transparent. I talk about ADHD, I talk about divorce, moving. I, I don't believe everyone should be as transparent or needs to be, but I do expect people to ask yourself decisions, ask yourself questions that you maybe have previously answered. Why, why aren't you sharing this online or why aren't you telling that story? And then do a little risk first reward. What's the risk of actually sharing that? And what's the reward? And if the reward outweighs the risk, I challenge you to put it out there because I can tell you the amount of doors and people I've connected to by simply talking about my ADHD and talking about medicated at the age I was and how I turned it into my superpower has really allowed me to connect in ways I never dreamed of. And I, I want to connect with people at that level. And I think the more of us that we can have sharing our vulnerabilities and, and understanding that the better we are. And, you know, if you're, you know, you're challenged by video or you're, you want, you know, feedback, you know, feel free to tag me on, on a channel and I will happily, uh, give feedback. You know, I always Aww. say that every channel, uh, I reply to every tweet that is ever mentioned that is sent to me, uh, every message on Instagram. There's not a, a team behind me. Like that's the part I love doing the most. So, uh, yeah, connect with me on your favorite uh, channel. And, uh, 
if you're into LinkedIn, I have something in the works on LinkedIn very soon um, that I'm actually working on, uh, actually with LinkedIn, the brand, uh, that if you're if you're into LinkedIn, which I can tell you just, we didn't talk about this, but 65% of my closed leads last year came from LinkedIn, 65%, just one channel, 65%. I uploaded one video a week, every single week of the year, just one video shot from my iPhone um, on LinkedIn. It, it accounted for about 65%. 62 to 65% of my closed leads. Okay. So yeah. What type of video was it? Um, so most of it was spot leadership. So I would say, hey, what's up, LinkedIn? Brian Fanzo here. This is something I experienced. This is something I have an opinion on. Um, no call to action at the end. Very, right. hey, this is something I have an opinion on. The piece that I think was the magic was uh, saying what's up, LinkedIn, and making it personalized for LinkedIn. I got a lot of comments saying, we can't believe you're creating content for us. And thank you for doing this for us. And that started relationships and engagements on there. I'm bullish on LinkedIn. I, I've been oh, yeah. bullish on LinkedIn for a, a long time. You know, I, it's the only, funny enough, it's the only platform that I have pushed notifications on my phone for. I don't have notifications on for Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, or, but uh, LinkedIn, I do. And, you know, that's, I, I'm, in, I'm in this for a business sense. I'm not, you know, as much as I love, I talk about caring and empathy, but I'm all about moving that business needle. And so, Listen, yeah, connect with me on, a whole bunch of business here. owners are in it for their business. So we yes. get it completely. And we can bring our whole selves to how we communicate to our target audience and how we, you uh, move our business models forward. But yes, we're in to monetize our businesses. No fooling around. And to that point, anyone who's watching this live or later, if you know a virtual event planner or a virtual event that needs someone like Brian Fanzo, you get him into the loop. You make that introduction for him, okay? Founders love to open doors for other founders, add wind to other founders' sales. So I'm counting on you and giving Brian some of your wonderful lift and opening of doors. I really appreciate that. And, and viewers, you know, thank you for carving out time to up your founder game, to open up your mind, to expand. You know, I know you found a nugget or two to strengthen that muscle and help you win at your founder game tonight. If you have any questions for Brian or me, please leave the and in the comment section or shoot me an email, Andy at andylyons.com. I wanna let you know that next Tuesday, March 26 at 7 p.m., we're chatting with Dr. Rebecca Heiss. She's a startup founder and speaker, but she's focusing on helping people fear less. And of course, founders, we're handling fear all the time, right? Because when we fear less, we make room for more, more creativity, more connection, abundance, innovation, and joy. Be sure to join my meetup group, Startup Life Live, to receive alerts about next events. That's bit.ly, the link bit.ly, Startup Life Live, okay? And for those of you who are watching the recording, which will be on YouTube, please click the subscribe button and click on the bell icon, okay? Thank you. And Everyone, please subscribe to my monthly newsletter. Let's stick together. It takes a village to raise a business. And this is how we can all lift each other up. Do you need a pitch deck reviewed? I've raised millions from VCs and thousands from angels, and I'm a co-host of a monthly pitch event. So please, I can help you and your pitch deck get ready for your next investor pitch and your next pitch event. And I feel so strongly, you do not need to go through this alone, this period of time. I'm here for you and I can hold your hand with a Startup Founders Mentoring Session. You can call me, I call it my urgent care clinic <laughs> for founders. You can give me an emergency call. I charge by the minute and I'll help you restore your business and your state of mind to a healthy condition. All the links below are in the show notes. Be sure to use Lifeline when booking a session for it a really special and delicious discount. Brian, oh my gosh, the fact that you showed up in the middle of a power failure is so mind blowing. I cannot believe it. Any last thoughts for our audience? No, I love it. And I love all that you said. You know, I, I, you know, I firmly believe that we is greater than me. And, you know, to be part of a, a, a great we, you have to be first your very best self and, and be the best me um, that you can be. And to be the best me that you can be, Oftentimes it takes some outside help, some adjusting in our world. And so I love the message. I love that you had me on. I can't believe my ring light held on the entire time. I, I was like, if we can make an hour, I'll be really happy. And the fact that my somehow my power I know. lasted and somehow 
like it's not raining and somehow my power is still out. So that's, uh, you know, I'll just roll with that uh, here when we get done. But thanks so much for having me on. This was uh, a heck of a so, lot of fun. Yeah. I, I forgot the power was out. So you, you gave me a, a nice break and an advantage for that. Yay. So, uh, oh, that's so wonderful. Hey, listeners, we got the best example of how we flow as founders tonight. Until next time, stay strong, stay focused. Hey, stay home and stay healthy, right? And please remember, you've got this. Cheers, everyone. Thank you so much. It was so great to see all of you tonight.